Hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, Unit Testing Crusty Traditional Synergy Code. Uh, I'm Phil Bratt, and I'm joined by our presenter here, uh, Synergex Software Engineer Arif Zain. Uh, Arif joined Synergex in 2013 and is currently a software engineer working mainly on the Synergy DBL integration for Visual Studio. Uh, through the years, he's made various improvements and done maintenance in the SDI product areas, such as the IntelliSense and project system functionalities. He's currently developing and implementing Visual Studio 2022 support for SDI and is involved with interfacing the SDI product with other product sets in the Synergy family, such as the compiler, installer, and more. Lots of work. So uh, there will be time for a QA uh, session after the presentation, of course. Uh, in the meantime, be sure to post questions to the chat er uh, area or the QA area. We'll see both of them. Uh, for any technical issues, please contact classes at synergex.com. And this session is being recorded. So. Hi, welcome to Unit Testing Crusty Traditional Synergy Code. My name is Arif Zain. I am a software engineer with the SDI team. In case you're not familiar, that is the Synergy language integration for Visual Studio. And in this presentation, we'll go over how to write unit tests around crusty traditional synergy code. So if you have a lot of crusty code accumulated over the years, it might feel daunting or might seem difficult to start writing your unit tests. You're never quite sure how to go about it, where to start. And the goal of this presentation is hopefully to make you feel more comfortable and so you can start writing your first unit tests around crusty traditional synergy code. So this presentation is a little bit of a continuation from a previous presentation, which is making crusty code testable by Marty Lewis. If you have not caught that presentation, I highly recommend catching a recording of it, but if not, We'll go over a short overview of about what happened in that presentation. So basically, in the previous presentation, we have old crusty synergy traditional code, and we did some work in it to make it more accessible and unit testable. Particularly, there are some internal routines which we turn into a more accessible class and fields and methods and we encapsulated them in a namespace for easier namespace management and imports. So the end result is more maintainable and unit testable code. And from there, we can start writing unit tests around it. So just a quick overview of what we'll go through in this presentation. We'll go through what is unit testing, why we might want to write unit tests, and what's available as far as unit testing in Synergy. Particularly in traditional Synergy unit testing, we'll go over some of the features that's associated with it, and then we'll do a short demo about how to write traditional Synergy unit tests. So what is unit testing? Unit testing is testing small individual pieces of the code base and these small individual tests could be used to build larger or more complex testing. This is pattern, what we call a foundational test. Why would we want to write unit tests? Because unit tests are fast, they run independently, and they are portable. And these characteristics makes unit testing ideal for test group test-driven development, or TDD, and continuous integration, or CI. So a lot of buzzwordy acronyms there. And with unit tests, the code base itself results to in a better code quality. And it also saves a resource for the organization overall by allowing developers to find bugs early in the development process. So what's available for unit testing in Synergy? Testing in Synergy is divided into two large parts. One part is the Synergy.NET unit testing, 
which piggybacks off of the .NET MS test framework. And on the other side of that, we have the traditional synergy unit testing, which is the focus of this presentation. And we have an internal traditional unit test framework. And we also have an interface with the MS test test adapter that allows us to integrate with Visual Studio and provide us features like populating the test in Test Explorer, running them in Visual Studio and debugging them, etc. So just a quick feature overview of the traditional synergy unit test framework. In it, we have the assert class. So typical use of the assert is to assert things is true, is not null, and things like that. So that forms the basis of our unit tests. And we also have test attributes, such as test method, test class, etc. And we also have a test runner DBR, which are dynamically generated to link against the ELBs, basically, which contains the code that you are running the unit test against. And like, men like I mentioned, it also comes with official studio integration, which contains a traditional unit test project template. It has a test explorer integration, and we also have debugging support in Visual Studio, so you can step through your tests while it's running. And we also have a command line integration via VS Test Console. An example, you can just call VS Test Console.exe against myunittest.elb, where myunittest.elb is the ELB that is created from the traditional unit test project. The benefits of running it via the command line is the results are exportable. And also it is ideal for continuous integration because running unit tests from the command line is a lot easier than running it in a full Visual Studio UI, especially if we're talking continuous integration in a pipeline. All right, as I mentioned before, this demo is a little bit of continuation from a previous presentation, which is making Crafty Code testable by Margo Lewis. And if you haven't ca caught that demo, it's fine. We'll go through roughly what happened in that session. But basically, here we have a small subpart of the Synergy Toolkit window code. And in the last session, we basically made these into a more unit testable format. As you can see, we have a namespace here and a winster class class. Previously, all of this is contained within one big subroutine, which is not unit test friendly. But now it's all encapsulated within a namespace and a class. And all the previous logic that used to happen is encapsulated within this WinStore class constructor. As you can see, there's all the logic. So this is in a pretty good shape for us to start writing unit tests around. The only small change I've made is the are these class fields. This used to be contained within this record here, but I've gone ahead and pulled them and made them into their separate class fields, just to make it more accessible when we go and write our unit tests. And as you can see, these are number of rows, which signifies the height of the window, number of columns, which signifies the width of the window, and the window name itself. So we'll write some tests around it. And the objective of this demo is to write unit tests around this class that we just newly created, WinStore class. And in particular, we want to test the constructor here, which is which contains all the old logic. So let's just get started. 
So from here, we'll just go ahead and add a new traditional unit test project. And we'll call it test demo. Very creative name. And as we can see here, the default template comes with test class and test method for us to start writing in. And it also comes with an import to our Serendex test framework, which contains the assert class and the test attributes. So we're in good shape here. And let's go back to the live code to see how we can go about writing unit tests. So we can see here that the constructor is wrapped around this subroutine Winsker. So let's see where this Winsker subroutine gets called. Okay, looks like it gets called here with some arguments. SDK first, which signifies the default version. And it looks like we have a terminal channel, a library channel, which is the output script file channel, which is the input and just a done flag. And we can check back in our subroutine here to check that these are indeed the arguments. So for us to write our unit tests, we need to mimic these arguments, basically create a mockup for it. And just by looking at these, the version should be pretty easy to mock up. As we can see, there was a default version. We can just pass that through. The terminal channel, we can probably just pass a dummy channel because we won't be actually rendering anything into the terminal. The Windows library channel and the script file channel, which is the input and output, would probably have to get actually initialized because that's what we'll be testing the code with. And then the done flag, we can just create a mockup pretty easily. So let's just get started here. And see what's going on in this file. Looks like there's some um, initialization logic. And a lot of record fields and a lot of definition includes. And there's a pass in script name which is probably our script file that we want to work with. But we can provide the script file ourselves in the unit test, so that shouldn't be a problem. But to start with, let's just paste this defines and includes, so we have access to them in our unit test. And if we are doing initialization steps, like what we're trying to do here, it's usually a good practice to put them in a in an initializer method. It could be an assembly initialize or class initialize or test initialize. Those gets run at different stages, but for our purposes here, class initialize is probably appropriate. So let's make a method. Call it class initializer. And let's provide our class initialize attribute, like so. And as I mentioned, we'll just bring over the includes and the defines so we have access here. And while we're at it, let's bring along these record fields too. We 
Now we probably won't need a lot of these fields, but we can always go back and clean them up after. But for now, we'll just bring them all in and see what we need. And we'd like to bring all this initialization logic that we are trying to mock up. Let's go until the window processing because that is what we are interested in testing. Let's put that in the proc of our initializer method. And we probably don't need these other handlers. We're just interested in the window handling. Looks like we're missing an end case and an end, so let's provide that. So, let's see what else we have. Missing a lot of labels, but it looks like they're just exit labels and error handling labels, which is fine. Don't particularly need them, so let's take that out. And we can take all of these up too. That should be fine. And it looks like there's processing to construct the script name. So we can skip a lot of these since we will be providing our script file as an input in the initializer. Let's take all these out. And then let's remove these error handlings. We'll just make our script file error free. Okay. So speaking of providing our own script file, now is a good time to segue to a different SDI feature, which is the Synergy script and Visual Studio. So in case you didn't know, we also have support for Synergy Script in Visual Studio. As you can see here, I can create a project. And let's just create one. As you can see, it comes with its own script file, but you can add your own script file. You can edit them and it handles building the script files and you can include it in other solutions, which contains other projects so you can provide dependencies but that's not what we are here to discuss so let's just make a simple script file here so we can use in our unit test let's just start with a dot script and let's add a window because that's what we are trying to test Let's provide a name, call it test win. And let's provide a window width and height. So say 15 and 75. So, and that's pretty much what we need. So pretty simple script file. There's not a lot going on. It's just a window, which is what we are trying to write unit tests against, but it'll work for our unit tests. So let's just copy the hat here so we can use it. Switch back to this. And we can just provide it and enter it into the script name variable here. Like so. And at this point, we can try building. Hopefully it'll build and pick up our tests. Very good. Build succeeded. And as you can see, the test explorer pick up our new tests. 
Of course, it's still empty and doesn't really do anything, but at least it's building. We can try running it and see if our initialize method works. So it looks like we have an illegal channel number specified, which makes sense because we haven't really provided a terminal channel here and we haven't really initialized the output channel. So as I said, we can just provide a dummy terminal channel. Let's just put in a one there. And not really sure how we can initialize the output channel because if we go to the live code, doesn't seem like this gets initialized anywhere in this file, or at least in this routine. So let's go one step up and see where this function gets called. Okay, SCR open library, that looks promising. Okay, as we can see, this is where we open the output channel. And it looks like there's some logic around deciding whether we want to create the ISAM file. And this is where we actually create it. So let's copy some of these initialization logic. And we can put it in our initialize, initializer class. Let's put it over here. And to keep it simple, we'll just always create the ISAM file. Just not exactly ideal, but it should work for our first run of this unit test. these parts either and we don't need these parts because we are already initializing the output channel okay looks like we don't have a length variable which is easy enough to fix let's provide one here and instead of using a placeholder holder variable. We can just use the gs underscore live name variable directly. And we'll just omit the error handling. And of course we don't really want to return here so let's omit that too. And now it looks like we are missing the underscore rec size, so let's go back to the live code. Looks like it's a uh, dot define, which comes from this, it looks like. So let's bring that over and add it to our list of define includes. There we go. And now it knows the underscore rec size. And we'll also provide the output name here. Let's put it to ctest, test.ism, like so. Okay, the only thing missing is probably we don't really want to call this subroutine to Winsker. Instead, we can just call the constructor directly here. 
because all it is is a wrapper. Let's go ahead and do that. But we do want to use the variables that we have created. So let's copy them over. Don't need this X call anymore. And take we want to assign it to an instance of the WinSCAR class so we can test it easier in our unit tests. So let's add the class field to the test class. Call it WinSCAR instance. I'll type it the winster of course it doesn't know what winster class is because we haven't added an import to the namespace let's go ahead and do that as you can see it added an import to the script namespace and now knows what the class is and we can assign this to our class field instance oh, got a typo there there we go and after we are done with the constructor we can just exit out of the initializer method so let's provide an m return here and we'll have to wrap this all up inside of a begin and blah let's go all right let's try building again and running it all right we have a green check mark which means at least our initializer is not running into a runtime error somewhere but we're not we're still not quite sure if it actually works so let's start writing a test to test the winscar instance that we just created here so let's write a test that test the window name go and we can use the winscar instance that we just created and we'll check the wnd name here and we'll use our assert class sir dot is true let's use that and Let's validate that the name is equals. Let's take a peek at the other script file here. We call it test win. So that's what, what we want to check against. Okay. Go ahead and build that so it can pick up our new test. There we go. Update it to the test window name and let's just try running it all right we still got a green check mark which makes me nervous because still we're not quite sure if it's actually testing what we think it's testing or not so let's let's try changing the expected value to something else so this should fail All right, it does fail. Oh. Usually not too happy when we see test fails, but in this case, that's what we're looking for. So let's just change it back. But of course, there's an easier way to determine whether the test is actually running or not, and that is to just debug the test. You can set a breakpoint here. Just right click the test and we can debug the test.
so any of the usual debugger in Visual Studio features are available here. As you can see, we have the local window, we have the watch window, and should be able to just hover over the variables to see what the contents are. And as you can see, our win name is indeed test win. So we can be fairly conf confident that our initializer is doing what it's supposed to be doing. Let's continue and run that. Okay, well, that's the hard part. Once you have the initializer in place, writing new tests is fairly simple because we have this WinStar instance already in place. We can reuse that for other tests. Say we want to write additional tests to test the window's height and width. So let's just copy and paste there. And let's check for the window's height. If I can type and test the windows width, and then also we'll have to check check the field that we are testing against. Never quite remember whether the column is the width or the height, and it looks like the column is the width and the row is the height. So. We'll want to use the row here. And here we want the, col the columns. And let's peek back into our script file. It's like the width should be 15 and the height should be 75. So that's the value we are looking for. All right, let's just build that and see what happens. And let's try running it. And there you go. And of course you can run the test individually, but if you want to run them all at once, you can click on the any of the parent objects here. Just click run and it'll run all of the tests in parallel if possible. So that's it. We just wrote uh, three new unit tests that test the functionality of a piece of code that we just decrustified a little and as you can see through the process it's really not that intensive in efforts so the pattern here is to change our subroutines into a more available pattern such as a class and a namespace so we can easily import them into our unit tests and use it and validate against it. Once you've done that, writing the unit test is not too bad. Of course, there's more things that we can do here in the unit tests. As I mentioned before, we can go ahead and clean these record fields. A large part of it we probably are not using. Same goes with the define list here. We're probably not using a lot of these. And we can probably dynamically generate the input script file instead of creating one ourselves here. The same goes for the output. And speaking of the output, it's usually good practice when we are writing a unit test and it has an initializer to also provide a cleanup. Like the initializer, the cleanup could be assembly level or class level or test level, but if you are creating a file for your test, it's a good practice to clean it up after the test is done. And of course, speaking of the code, instead of copying the initializer logic here, we could instead make the whole thing decrustify all the way up. So instead of having these function 
we can convert this function into a publicly available class and wrap it in a namespace. So in our unit test, we can just import the namespace and we should have access to the function or separate the initializer logic elsewhere. So there's a lot of optimization that we can do, that we can do here, but I think we did a pretty good job and short demo here. And of course, from here, instead of running the tests via the Visual Studio UI, as I mentioned, we can also run it from the command line. You can just run it via the pstest.console. And what that gives us is the flexibility to export the results elsewhere to be consumed. And also, if you are running it in the command line, it can be part of an automated process as part of your build process. So if you kick off a build, it can kick off the running of the unit test and automatically validate the results. And even one step after that, we can plug the whole thing into a CI CD system, continuous integration. So as soon as a change get pushed into your code base, the unit test can get ran and it can immediately validate the changes to make sure they are not breaking anything. So lots of possibilities there. And that was the demo. So hopefully after the demo, we made you a little bit more comfortable in writing traditional unit tests. And we'll just open it up to the floor. Who has the first question? We do have a question from Gordon. I I, I think he, this was just triggered based on some of the stuff that I was saying. Um, but he was he was asking about talk of a utility to identify unused variables and defines mentioned at a dev partner conference a few years ago. Arif, I don't know if you know if we're currently working on a feature like that. Um, I might have to get back to you on that one, Gordon. <laughs> um, not actively working on it, but. Um... There's definitely a there's definitely a resource center idea that mm -hmm. talks about um, adding a feature so that uh, when we do a build, it'll show um, unused variables um, or defines. And I can link the resource center link yeah. here if you want to vote on it. There's currently two votes and. Uh, the more votes um, an go. item has, the more likely we'll actively work on it. So um, if you'd like that feature, Gordon, um, go ahead and give that idea a thumbs up. Mm -hmm. Yes. Or, you know, it bend Steve's ear um, always helps too. <laughs> um, Dan has a question, uh, our own Dan Ellis here. So I think you can also unit test subroutines in addition to methods. Is there any downside to testing subroutines versus, and functions versus putting them in methods, I assume? Um, yeah, you can definitely just X call a subroutine or a function in your unit test. Um, but uh, it's mostly about portability or accessibility, and in which case you want, instead of um, referencing the library directly, you want to reference the namespace. Um, well, if the crusty code has been decrustified and it's yeah. been wrapped in the namespace, you might as well use that. But um, if it's not, and you just want to get from point A to point B and everything's still in separating through functions, then yeah, you can just X call the separating through functions, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think better you get better metrics and stuff from the results if uh, if you decrustify and wrap sure. those all up, right? Yeah. Yeah, probably easier to debug through them too, because oh, yeah, that too. Of course. <laughs> um, so speaking of getting results, um, so with the the VS test console exe um, or exe uh, when it ex when it's exporting uh, the results, what format do those come out as? So by default, um, it exports it in a .resx file format, which is a Visual Studio test results file. You can open mm -hmm. it in Visual Studio or oh, cool. Visual Studio Code, I believe. Um, yeah. But um, you can supply additional options in the VS Test Console XC. Um, I think it's a logger flag. And you can specify the output. You can 
just output it to the console, output it to an HTML file. Mm. And if you want, if you have different um, unit tests frameworks in place, like XUnit or MUnit, things like that, you can also supply those. Um, I think those requires additional NuGet packages that you have to install, but it's definitely possible to export it to those different formats. Yeah, worth it makes it pretty digestible, which is nice. Um, although the, the default's not too bad either. Um, so with Synergex unit testing, you know, I, you know, where you, you're using it in this demo, I assume that Synergex um, also uses unit testing in our CI CD processes. Uh, right. So in SDI, at least we definitely mm -hmm. use unit testing as part of our build process. Um, we have unit, uh, unit tests in place that gets run whenever we kick off a build. So we can verify that the change doesn't um, break things and we mm -hmm. can catch failures early on. Yeah. And you can see all those green check marks. I tell you, it's so satisfying <laughs> to see the green check marks. <laughs> well, in, in a pipeline, it will just show, uh, so you don't quite get the green check mark. Ah, or, uh, this is true. This but... is true. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's just such a bright, vibrant green. Um, <laughs> So, uh, you know, with the, the built-in stuff that comes with uh, unit testing inside of, uh, you know, Visual Studio and those, uh, those kind of things, there are, I, I noticed that there are some different uh, initialized cleanup attributes. Uh, so what are the differences between like test initialize, class initialize, assembly initialize? Um, so they differ in when they get executed, basically the order of the mm -hmm. execution. Um, Assembly initialize is at the top level. Um, the assembly initialize or assembly cleanup gets run only once um, before all tests and classes initialize or cleanup. Um, class initialize then gets run next. Um, it gets run whenever the test class instan instance gets created. And then test initialize gets run before every indi individual test gets run. So. If you have multiple tests, then it'll do test one. I mean, sorry, test initialize and then test mm -hmm. run one, then test initialize again, test run two, and so on. Yeah, that makes it pretty efficient and fast too, which is uh, pretty cool. So yeah, um, all the different timings in there. Uh, thanks for your input, Paul. The, uh, yeah, I, I, I was going to say, we do have the, 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 VAR, uh, the VAR review. Um, QVAR review uh, in there. I'm gonna have to remember all the all the details on um, when that uh, when you call that from the compiler. But uh, yeah, thanks for the input. Um, <laughs> hopefully, Gorn, you got enough. Like I said, you can always bend Steve's ear on that. So, um, any other questions? I I'm out. So. <laughs> I think that's it. So I think we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. We have the next presentation coming in 15 minutes. So thank you all for joining us. Um, and be sure to join us for the next presentation, uh, which is using BI tools to create dashboards, KPIs, and analytics. Um, really cool stuff. So that's going to be from our senior PSG consultant, Dan Ellis. So thanks for joining us. We'll see you then. Bye. Thanks, everyone.